Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMin 2024. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Peter uh, Michar from uh, the University of uh, Vienna, Austria, who will talk about uh, closed surfaces with different shapes that are indistinguishable by the square root normal form. Over to you, Peter, please. Thank you. So I hope you see my slides well. Uh, this is my title. And here is the abstract that I sent out. And my lecture is based on a paper together with Eric Klassen. And I think that was the reason why I was invited to give this lecture. Uh, but Eric Klassen gave this lecture already. And so I, I copy large parts of his lecture. And there is also a paper of interest given on the bottom of this. So I shall start with shape space. What is shape space? There are many different kinds of shape spaces. Namely, problems arise in anthropology, namely space of hominid skulls. Or in computational anatomy, you have the space of uh, tomographic images of hearts or of brains or of parts of the brains, like the amygdala, amygdala or the singular cyrus or so. Then there is the space of walking rhythms. So you, you, you just uh, make a movie of a person walking and you want to, to find out whether he has some irregularities or how he should train. Or the space of breathing lungs which is very important if you use radiation to kill a cancer, but this radiation must stay on the cancer and not deviate even if the patient is breathing. So you see there, there are many, many problems here um, to, to really analyze these things. Then there is evolutionary biology, so it's the space of evolutionary trees or spaces of butterfly wings. And one needs meaningful distances on these spaces to do statistical analysis of a point cloud in the shape space. So a point cloud in the shape space is maybe 150 tomographic data of hearts given by a a hospital and you want a distance so that you can uh, see whether some hearts uh, uh, sort of have uh, they, 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 they sort of uh, a cluster somewhere and some other hearts cluster there and some other hearts cluster in other point and uh, those that cluster here have this kind of heart disease and those that cluster here have another kind of heart disease and the rest are the healthy hearts. And uh, if, if you develop this distance in a right way, then uh, computers can do better diagnosis than radiologists. So infinite dimensional differential geometry offers a way to do this via geodesic distance of suitable Riemannian metrics. So what is a shape space? So let M be a template or model shape, a compact manifold for simplicity's sake. Then we look at the space of embeddings from M into RD, and this sits into the space of immersions from M to RD. So immersions allow for self-intersections, but the differential must be everywhere injective. And then we have uh, the action of the diffeomorphism group of the template manifold acting by composition from the right on both of these spaces. And we if we factor this out on the left-hand side, the space B is the base of a principal fiber bundle. And on the left-hand side, it might have uh, singularities, but of a very mild type. So every 
diffeomorphism invariant Riemannian metric above induces a unique metric below on the shape space such that the projection pi is a Riemannian submersion. So uh, I just want to mention the simplest diff invariant metric on space of embeddings or immersions, namely integral over the inner product pointwise of H with H uh, integrated with the volume form of the pullback metric of the metric of RD has vanishing geodesic distance. So any two shapes cannot be distinguished. Any two embeddings cannot be distinguished. Peter, could ask a question about this formula? Yeah. So, so this h, small h. Is, um, uh, this small h is a tangent vector along an embedding f. So it's a vector field which projects to the embedding f. It's a vector field, a, a mapping from m into the tangent space of Rd, which projects to the embedding. Okay, uh, so this is this is, is this a distance metric between two different embeddings? Yes. Uh -huh. the, 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 no, the, this is just a Riemannian metric. This is an infinitesimal metric on the tangent space of uh -huh. shape space or of embeddings. And the distance is then the infimum of arc lengths with respect to this metric of curves connecting two different shapes. Okay, so, so here... this is difficult to compute. Right. So F here is an immersion, it is fixed. And then we can see the um, tangent spaces at different points. The tangent space at F of the space of embeddings. Oh. These are all vector fields along F. I see. These are the H. Okay. And G naught, G zero. Yeah, it, it 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 will become clearer later. Right. So G naught is is just uh, the inner product on R D, and F star G naught is the induced Riemannian metric on M, and vol is the the volume form for this uh, Riemannian metric. So there is uh, some complicated formulas in in coordinates behind that, but uh, you have to do this to be diffeomorphism invariant. Okay, thank you, Peter. So, uh, so this uh, becomes then a, a Riemannian manifold, an infinite dimensional weak Riemannian manifold, and it has curvature. It is curved. And the curvature complicates statistics because statistics is essentially a Euclidean theory. You, you, you look at means and you look at principal component analysis, you look at straight lines which minimize uh, the sum of square distance to the points of the data and you see if, if, you, if you are on a Riemannian manifold where the geodesics can can come together again or deviate in each case, it makes problems for statistics. And this led to a new kind of statistics, statistics on curved space or on more general spaces. Okay. The motivation for the square root normal form is because the square root normal form works very well on plane curves. So consider on plane curves just the L2 metric. So Q is a, a smooth function from S1 into Rn, and it should be an immersion, which I have not written here. And you look at the Riemannian metric, so H are vector fields along the curve, theta is the parameter along the curve. And uh, so in, you integrate just with uh, the fixed uh, parameter. This is a flat, weak Riemannian metric. Geodesic distance is given by the L2 form. It has a flat curvature, so the distance 
is really the geodesics are the straight lines. It's a pre-Hilbert space. And now you consider a function f and you pull back this metric to immersions. So f upper star of this metric at a curve c evaluated at tangent vectors h is just this g that we have at f of c and this dch is the differential of f taken at c in the direction h. So if f from immersions of plane curves into smooth functions in Rn satisfies this condition here, so it acts under a right translation by a diffeomorphism like a half density. And if f is infinitesimally injective, then gf is a Riemannian metric on space of immersions that is invariant under the reparametrization group. So now we use arc length derivative, d lower s, which is, oh, the d theta should be up. That's a mistake. And, uh, and we have arc length measure and we take a smooth function f from R to M to Rn and we define the transform f as uh, f of c is the square root of c prime multiplied with f and you uh, feed in f c dsc d square sc and so on and uh, then the image of f is a submanifold of the flat pre hilbert space and uh, this gives you a method to write down formulas for the geodesics if you can uh, find the formulas on this submanifold of the flat pre hilbert space so a simple example is by uh, srivastara who uh, uses it a lot it's it's uh, the mapping r it goes from immersions of uh, of the circle into r2 modulo translation What does it mean, modular R2. translations? Yeah. So, Peter, it does mean that we somehow move, say, the center of mass to the origin. Yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. You you just uh, factor out the action of the translation group on R2 from the space of immersions. It doesn't see immersions. So R of C is uh, the differential of C absolute value, uh, square root of this, times uh, uh, unit speed of C. So DSC, I should have written instead of V. The image is an open subset, and the pullback metric is this metric that is written here. And this metric has now very simple geodesics because uh, geodesics are just the inverse images under this mapping R. And this is easy to compute by a formula of straight lines. Another example, a little more complicated is this RAB. So you, you go from the same space, but now open curves, not closed curves, into C infinity zero to pi into R3. And you take the same uh, square root of, uh, of the length of the differential. And then you take A times unit speed vector comma zero plus uh, square root of four B square minus A square of zero. This is a two dimensional zero and one. 
So here A and B in R2 are positive numbers and the image is curves in a cone, a cone in R3. And the angle, the opening of the cone is, is given by uh, 4B square minus A square. And if you drop this, you get a cone where the, the opening angle is larger than 2 pi. So you cannot embed it into R3. But it's, a, it's still a flat Riemannian manifold and it's easy to, to write down geodesics and uh, to get the geodesic spec and so on. So now maybe I, I omit this movie. It's too complicated to, to get it up. So this, some of these metrics extend to the boundary consisting of Lipschitz curves. And this boundary contains many finite dimensional submanifolds of polygonal curves, namely for each fixed number of nodes, and they are geodesically convex. And their geodesics are soliton solutions of the original equation in the sense that their momenta are finite sums of delta distributions. And uh, a suitable square root uh, transform is compatible with this extension. Okay, now I come to the square root normal form map. So the square root normal form map uh, was uh, defined in a naive way by mathematicians. They were just uh, uh, following uh, the, the success of the, of the square root transform for plane curves, and they tried to extend this to surfaces. So let M be an oriented surface with or without boundary and assume it has a Riemannian metric, which is not really necessary. And you look at the space of immersions from M into R3. And given such an immersion F, uh, there is the area multiplication factor of F. And this is a factor from M into R2. And the formula of A of X, F is just uh, the length of the derivative at X in direction V cross the derivative of F at X in direction, in direction W where V and W are an orthonormal basis of the tangent space of M. Another way to say this is you pull back the Riemannian metric from R3 to M. So you have now two Riemannian metrics. You go to the two volume forms and you take uh, the quotient of the two volume forms. Then you get this function A. And now, you define the oriented unit normal. So, so we have the oriented no, unit normal function uh, from M into S2. So it's a unit normal along the embedded or immersed curve. And it is just DXF cross product with DFXW divided by its length. So we have now the square root normal field of F is defined as QF from M into RT and QF is the square root of A of X times the unit normal field F, X. So this tries to mimic the successful approach for plane curves to surfaces in R3. So the diffeomorphism group, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of M acts on immersions from the right by composition. And it acts on, on the image space of the square root normal form from the right, again by uh, composition from the right, but also by multiplying with the square root of B of X where B is the area multiplication factor 
very roughly you can, it, it's the determinant of the differential of gamma, where gamma is the diffeomorphism. So this action is defined so that the square root normal form is equivariant with respect to the right action of the diffeomorphism group. In fact, it's the action of the diffeomorphism group on the space R of R3 valued half densities. So each element of diff plus of M on R3, M uh, on, on, on the space of uh, the image space of the square root normal form acts by a linear isometry for the L2 metric on on these functions, these are three valued functions. So because of the isometric action, it makes sense to define a distance function in the shapes on uh, shape space immersions modulo diffeomorphisms by taking the distance between two classes of immersions, so submanifolds really, immersed submanifolds as the infimum between the two orbits, the infimum of QF and QG composed with gamma, where uh, the infimum is taken over all diffeomorphisms. So you, you fix one square root normal form and you have the whole orbit of square root normal forms on the other side and you take the infimum distance. One might also want to mod out rigid motions or rescalings or rotations, but uh, so the question is, is this uh, square root normal form injective? So F in brackets denotes the orbit of F in the space of immersions. In other words, if two immersed surfaces have the same square root normal form, must they have the same shape up to yeah. reparametrization? Peter, could, could you clarify it with point again? So we have um, a surface M embedded into a three-dimensional space, right? Yes. And then for this surface, we construct um, a new object, uh, square root normal form, and this have a correct kind of so this is a vector field on well, this, this is a function in R3. Yes, function in on every point of R3. No, no, it's it's a function from M into R3. From right, right. So mm -hmm. so this is uh, essentially at every point of M we have a vector. Yeah, a vector in R three. Uh -huh. so, so you you could say it is also a vector field along the embedded surface, mm -hmm. which is normal to the surface, yeah. and uh, whose length is the square root of the infinitesimal volume form. I see. Uh, yes, we could visualize it indeed as, as a vector field normal to uh, an yes. immersed surface in R3, but in principle, this M is abstract, right? So, um, yeah, no, M, M is maybe the sphere, or maybe yeah. so it's the sphere with a hole if you want to, mm -hmm. to model uh, heads, mm -hmm. for example. I mean, uh -huh. the, the hole would be where you have cuts off the head of the body. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, where the blood mm -hmm. runs out. Mm -hmm. uh, but for comparisons, uh, we um, take this infinum over diffeomorphisms. Yeah, so this is to make, to make the whole thing uh, reparametrization invariant. Okay. Uh -huh. And um, is it easy to explain the two-dimensional analog of this construction when we have uh, a curve, say a closed curve for simplicity in the plane? Yeah. Then uh, do we similarly construct a normal vector um, at every point? So we had, this is the analog. Uh -huh. Right, this one. This mm -hmm. is the analog. So C prime, the length of it uh, uh, 
the square root of this times the unit speed. You, you could also take the unit normal uh -huh. because they just differ by rotation. So it would okay. not it would not okay. make a lot of difference. So this is what they tried to to mm -hmm. generalize. Mm -hmm. And this two-dimensional analog, is it injective? Um, yes, that two-dimensional analog is injective. Right. Yes. It is, maybe it is uh, uh, the back, the back mapping, the reconstruction mapping is, is in, in this case, it's easy, it's unique. But in, in this case, the reconstruction map you, you see, in, in this case, mm -hmm. this mapping takes mm -hmm. a curve in R2 modulo translations into a curve in a cone in R3. So the reconstruction is a little more complicated, but given by an explicit formula. So very easy to put into a computer. Mm -hmm. And easy to compute the metric. And yes, yeah. and easy to compute the metric because the cone is also a, a flat Riemannian space. If you cut it off, you can make it flat, and then you just take uh, a straight okay. line there, and then you put it up on the cone. So there are explicit formulas. So easy to compute me means that, um, so we can actually uh, compute, uh, sorry, uh, express analytically the result, yes. so minimization over Infinitely no, no minimization necessary. No, no minimization necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, Peter, for interrupting you. I love, um, yeah, please. If you want to factor out reparameterizations, there is still minimization necessary. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But this okay. is all. This is all open source available, and it's like milliseconds for curves. Ah, so so there is some minimization involved, but it's uh, quick for curves. If you want to factor out reparameterizations, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Martin. Sometimes you want to keep the parameterization. So I have to find where I have been. So is, is the square root normal form injective? Answer is no. Uh, easy examples in the beginning are you take a cylinder, a standard cylinder with two circles as boundary, and you define two embeddings, F and G, from M into R3. Uh, by one is just uh, just a standard embedding, and the other one is you enlarge the circle, but you reduce the height. So one is tall and thin, and the other is short and fat, and they have the same square root normal form. Another example of non-injectivity is paraboloids. So, uh, if you if you have a paraboloid in R three, that's the the graph of a function c is a x square plus b y square in R three, and uh, given a b, you can reparameterize the whole thing by by taking this formula here. And then the normal just depends on the product of A and B. And uh, also the, 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 the volume form depends only on the product of A and B. And therefore, you see, if just the product of A and B is the same, then the square root normal form is also the same. So it's not injective. So here is an image here. Now, if you have two oriented surfaces in R3, and suppose you have an orientation preserving diffeomorphism phi from one surface to the other, 
that preserves area and also normal direction, which means that the unit normal at phi of x equals the unit normal of x in R3 for all x in S1. Then for any parametrization of S1, firing f is a parametrization of uh, S2, and the square root normal forms are the same. And this is obvious because the square root normal form is just a normal field multiplied by the square root of the volume density. So for example, look at this chess pieces. So of course, this whole thing is now an embedded S2, an embedded sphere, which is so, so, the, so the, the, the plate has some thickness and uh, this thing are always a little round and the figures, they just sit there. So now you move a figure here and here you, you move a figure, but then you can find a diffeomorphism, which is the identity almost everywhere, but where you move the figure, you you just catch this movement with uh, with uh, volume preserving and with transporting along the normal field, and therefore the square root normal form cannot distinguish between these two chess positions or any Peter, of them. Sorry, between all six, so all six, all six yeah, none yeah. of them. All, all six have this same square root normal form. But if you remove one figure, then of course it has a different one. Uh -huh. so, so to clarify to everyone, so hopefully I understood it correctly, you, you take indeed the boundary of this uh, physical chessboard, including uh, all pieces, all chess pieces. So Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this boundary, say, is uh, flat underneath, but when you, uh, it goes around every chess piece. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, here is the explanation that I have already given. So you can, uh, can look it up if you... Okay, now surface immersions and measures on the S3. So related questions to the non-injectivity is, is the following. Given F and G immersions from S2 on R3, can we give a geometric criterion when the distance between the, the, the orbits in the square root normal form space is zero. So when do they have the same square root normal form up to reparametrization? And the second question is, what is the L2 closure of the image of the square root normal form map? Uh, yeah. And what is the closure of each orbit? So, <clears throat> if you have an immersion, then you can uh, define by mu qf of u the area of the portion of f of m where the normal, the unit normal of x is contained in u for a, a subset u in R3. So if F and G differ only by reparametrization and translation, then these two measures are the same. Because this is now a measure on open subsets on R3. But the converse is not true. There are plenty of examples where these measures are the same, but F and G have completely different shapes. Look at this. One is just a, a unit sphere, and the other is you, you take uh, 
you take uh, a small hemisphere and you push it into, you flap it into. It has, of course, the same measure. So Eric Klaassen has some conjectures about these questions. The first uh, conjecture is for any Q in L2, M R3, the L2 closure of the diff plus orbit of Q is the same for two of them if the measures are the same. So if you restate this for immersions, then you see that the square root normal form orbits are the same. So the distance is the same if the two measures are the same. This means the square root normal form can only distinguish two immersions if they induce different measures on S2. Or the square root normal form only sees how much area each normal vector is at attained. It ignores the location of these normal vectors. And he conjectures that uh, the square root normal form mapping, then the L2 closure of the image of all immersions are those Qs in L2 such that the integral over the, the, the sphere of absolute Q times Q integrated over the sphere is zero. So this is uh, analogous to a uh, effect about the square root uh, velocity function for curves. Yeah, so let me not go too deep into this proof, but there is a, a quite old theorem from 1903 by Minkowski, Fenichel, Jessen, and Alexandrov, and it says the correspondence F goes to this uh, measure on S2 of the square root normal form gives a bijection between convex embeddings of S2 into R3 up to translation and reparametrization and measures mu on S2, which satisfy integral over S2 of X d mu of X is zero. So suppose we are given a Q in L2, S2, R3, which satisfies this condition, then it follows that this is zero. And by this old theorem, there is a convex embedding such that the two measures are the same. And by conjecture one, uh, the orbits are the same. And then it follows this, that Q is in, in this image. So. Uh, Eric Klassen claims this proof is, is not complete because uh, this theorem, this old theorem, does not give smooth solutions. So one should have to reprove it and uh, check it with smoothness. And in the end, <clears throat> I think Martin Bauer for these images, here are images, here are surfaces, where the square root normal form cannot distinguish between these surfaces, if the two conjectures are true. So, and uh, they, are, they are very probably true. So here you have a cat and uh, you have the unit normal of, of the cat and this induces a measure on the unit sphere because uh, that the normal is always on the unit sphere. So 
And here is the convex surface with the same measure on the unit sphere with respect to the normal. And here is a dog, and here is the convex version of the dog. And here is a gorilla, and here is the convex version of the gorilla. And you cannot distinguish that with the square root normal form. But you can distinguish convex surfaces with the square root normal form. And this is due to this old theorem of Minkowski and, and others. So for image uh, analysis, the square root normal form is not really very useful. So here is a final example. Neither can the square root normal form distinguish between these two surfaces. Of course, this has, has more content than this, but the, the, the surface measure on the, on the unit sphere with the normal is the same. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. So let's thank Peter for the beautiful talk, <clears throat> especially for, for these <laughs> surfaces, convex and non-convex. So let me now stop the...